named and shamed by the City Council on social media, on Facebook, as well as on the Council's own website. Oh, they should definitely be put in stocks. People, people who park in those lanes should definitely be kept in stocks for at least 24 hours. These aren't people, these are not, it seems, people convicted of offences, though, Michael. These are photos with no examination of circumstances. No, for example, the car could break down and they push it out of, push it out of the motorway to, let, to, to encourage the, the egress of traffic. So there are all sorts of explanations that, that could attach to it. Having said that, you know, it really ticks me off when I see, for example, a car being parked in a disabled car park or something like that. And that does annoy, and that does annoy me. But, but naming and shaming in such a quick shoot from the lip way uh, may not catch the circumstances. And, and arguably, uh, the council could, say, could find itself being the target of a defamation action. <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny. Uh, very good, Michael Bott. Thank you very much. Uh, Welcome. for illuminating those interesting legal issues. Uh, a new study from the University of Adelaide claims the Pahutakawa tree has a likely Australian origin. I just found that just before we came, and I can see you looking grave, Ella Henry. Uh, fossil research suggests a diversity of the Pahutakawa came from Tasmania, with a more re recent species of the tree blowing across the Tasman, which is fighting talk indeed. But I won't ask you about that. Pavlova, crowded exactly. house. all over mm. again. They can have Russell Crowe. Lamentations in Australia today. The country's dropped five places in the Social Progress Initiative's Best Places to Live survey, which is quite a big so survey, although I know there are lots of them. Australia's only ninth equal now from uh, with New Zealand, and the country's got low levels of tolerance and inclusiveness. An interesting comment from the Deloitte Australia Public Sector and Healthcare spokeswoman Fran Thorne. Like many other advanced nations, we have made very little gains in the past four years relative to what our gross domestic product indicates is possible to advance social pro progress. Does it strike you that the same applies to New Zealand at the moment? That's quite a small window, four years. I guess what I'm asking is we're told the economy's on fire, it's booming, and yet there are a whole lot of things we can't fix. Well, the economy is booming for a particular segment of New Zealand society. There's a chunk of New Zealanders that the economy is not booming for. And until we can universalise the benefits of that booming economy, then, we, we, you know, it's a, it's a sort of false profit. I yes, and I suppose that's what she means by advancing social progress. Mm. Mm. And th that's back to the issue that we started with at the very beginning, is how we share equitably the well-being of the nation. Yeah, mm. and we haven't how? solved that yet how in London you can have people living in uh, North, uh, North Kensington, living in a tower like that, and down the road, you know, 12 million pound houses. It's extraordinary, isn't it? The trick is, yeah, how do we share? The, a texter named Graham says, everyone acknowledges that capitalism's a terrific engine for driving invention, innovation, and the creation of personal wealth, but the profit mo motive doesn't engage well with the provision of essential infrastructure, health, education. So tax the people who do the best out of capitalism at a rate that allows the infrastructure of society that supports them also to also thrive. Here, here. There you go. Uh, Ella Henry, lovely to see you back. Kia ora, thank you. And, uh, and you're, you're mending too, I can I, tell. I believe I am. It's nice to see. And David King, thank you for your company again, David. No problem. Thank you very much, Jim. Thanks, everybody. See you, We're Ella. back, Take We're back care, tomorrow David. with the panel and Checkpoints with John Campbell on the way. Everyone tonight, National has Todd Barclay, Labour has 90 interns. The campaign experience doesn't live up to the billing for the volunteers who ended up in a cramped dormitory at a marae with a broken shower and no money to return home. Labour leader Andrew Little joins us to explain. Also tonight, we speak to Bill English about Todd Barclay and why he didn't resign for so long and then did. A bolter from the Blues makes the All Blacks. Wild weather strikes the far north. British Prime Minister Theresa May says sorry. A Christchurch couple appeal for the company who mistakenly water blasted their home to come forward. And the widow of a man killed after being struck by a car just down the road here thanks New Zealand for its incredible generosity. We're back after the news. RNZ News at 5. Kia ora, good afternoon. Call Katrina Batten, Dene.
The fallout over a national MP, Todd Barclay, is continuing, with the Prime Minister, Bill English, rejecting allegations of a cover-up. Dogged by controversy over secretly recording a former electorate staffer, Mr Barclay, the MP for Clutha Southland, will stand down at the election. Here's our political editor, Jane Patterson. Glenis Dixon later police complained about Mr Barclay making a secret recording of her in the Gore office. Opposition MPs have accused Mr English of a cover-up after he allowed Mr Barclay to stay on as a member of the caucus when he knew what had gone on. Mr English says he passed on the information he had to party officials and the police. The police are reassessing information that's come to light this week and will decide whether to reopen the investigation next week. Meanwhile, the New Zealand First Leader Winston Peters has has laid formal complaints with the Speaker over what he claims are misleading statements by Mr English. From Parliament, Jane Patterson. The Labour Party admits it's been embarrassing to have dozens of interns brought to New Zealand to campaign for the party complain about substandard living conditions. The 90 interns, mainly Americans, came here as part of the Campaign for Change as a push for greater democratic engagement. The interns were all staying on Auckland's Awataha Marae and the news website Politic has photos of cramped dormitories, broken and unusable showers, doors hanging off hinges and unfinished construction work with material piled beside mattresses. Labour's leader Andrew Little says he's disappointed how this has played out and they are now looking after the interns. It looks to me like it's got wildly out of control. The people have now found they can't manage it. The party's headquarters has found out about it um, and they've now stepped in to take control of it. Labour leader Andrew Little, the Marae's chief executive, Anthony Wilson, rejects the complaint that its facilities are substandard but admits they're not a five-star hotel. Mr Wilson wouldn't comment about how much money the Marae received to house the interns. He says it's fine if they move to different accommodation and wishes them all the best for the future, as many of them had become their friends. Islamic State jihadists have blown up the historic Grand Al Nuri Mosque in the Iraqi city of Mosul, along with its famed leaning minaret. The mosque is hugely significant to Iraqis, and its destruction comes in the closing day of the Iraqi army's battle to take back the country's second largest city from Islamic State. The BBC's Paul Adams reports. Iraqi military sources said militants belonging to so called Islamic State blew up the mosque as government forces advanced. For its part, IS said the mosque was destroyed by an American airstrike, a claim swiftly and emphatically denied by Major General Joseph Martin, one of the US-led coalition's commanding officers. IS, he said, had destroyed one of Mosul and Iraq's great treasures. This is a hugely symbolic moment. The mosque is where the IS leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, made his one and only public appearance almost three years ago as the leader of the group's self-proclaimed caliphate. Paul Adams reporting. A man who's been fighting dumping of used tyres for years says he can't wait for a proper disposal system to be finally put in place. A new government scheme will see about 60% of old tyres used as a biofuel to make cement. In addition, companies would have to get council consent for stockpiles of more than 2,500 2, tyres. Patrick Lynch says tyres have been dumped or abandoned at a couple of locations in Waikato. A school principal who submitted a false performance appraisal with her husband's signature on it has lost her teacher re re registration. The Teachers Disciplinary Tribunal says Jenny Lynch was the principal of Ferguson Intermediate for 22 years and gave her school's Board of Trustees the fake appraisal in November 2014. She signed the appraisal with the electronic signature of her husband, former King's College Principal Mike Leach. The tribunal says Ms Leach agrees it was serious misconduct and she should be censured and lose her registration. The Ministry for Primary Industries will do more testing of Fovo Strait wild oysters for a deadly parasite in the coming weeks. It wasn't scheduled to carry out its next test for Benamia Austria until September. The announcement comes after angry Stewart Island residents pressured the Ministry to do more testing, with farmed oysters being culled after the discovery of the parasite. A spokesman, Jeff Gwynn, says although he's confident the ministry's current testing regime is sufficient, he recognises further testing is important to the Stewart Island and Bluff communities. The ministry also says the cull is going faster than expected and the first stage will be completed by the end of tomorrow. It's five past five. 
The All Blacks coach Steve Hansen says Rico Ioane's form and recent performances against the British and Irish Lions left him with no choice but to include the 20-year-old in the starting 15 for Saturday's opening test at Eden Park. Ioane was the surprise selection in Hansen's first team of the year, usurping 53 test veteran Julian Savia and World Cup winner Waisaki Noholo for the left-wing berth with Israel Dagg on the opposite edge. Hansen says Ioane is the man for the job. Rico's been the guy that's been in best form uh, throughout the year, played really well for the Blues when given opportunities. Not, not the same uh, in the Maori game when he didn't get many opportunities. Uh, he's got electrifying speed uh, and we just think that uh, for this particular match he's the boy. So I guess the proof will be in the pudding. Steve Hansen. The All Whites coach Anthony Hudson says he'll take the heated exchanges on the field during their Confederations Cup clash with Mexico as a sign of respect. Mexico came from behind to beat the All Whites 2-1 in a sometimes spiteful clash in Sochi. There was, shout uh, there was a shouting match between the two benches in the first half while the game was stopped for more than five minutes late in the game when the referee used the video review to assist in handing out some yellow cards. New Zealand have lost both of their games and meet Portugal at the weekend. And after playing 85 one-day internationals for New Zealand, Black Caps wicketkeeper Luke Ronke has retired from international cricket. That's the news. Did the National Party obstruct justice? Trying to get someone to drop their case to uh, not bring a complaint to the police is enough to uh, be obstruction of justice in itself. A minister laments the fallout. It's actually quite hurtful in the sense of uh, good people but have fallen out and that now playing out in the public arena. And do politicians lie? Perhaps to save face out of a sense of conceit, ego, vanity, whatever, they will be less than forthcoming with the truth. Straight questions and sometimes straight answers. Morning reports with Guy and Aspiner and Susie Ferguson weekdays from 6. Then on 9 to noon, what's the future for insurance when 7 out of 10 jobs in the industry are at risk from major technological disruption? And after 10, how a 70-year-old Kiwi tale of great courage and escape has been translated into Italian and turned into an historic walk with the author's son, Harry Broad. Join me, Catherine Ryan, on 9 to noon after morning report on RNZ National. Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow. Northland to Waitomo, also Coromandel and Bay of Plenty. Showers, some possibly heavy and thundery. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, rain with some heavy falls, easing to a few showers tomorrow. Taranaki in the central high country to Kapiti, also wider upper. Occasional rain, easing to a few showers early tomorrow. Wellington, Marlborough, Nelson and Buller, periods of rain, clearing Buller tomorrow morning. Canterbury and coastal Otago, periods of rain or drizzle, snow down to 800 metres today. The remainder of Otago, also Westland, Fiordland and Southland, mainly fine with variable high cloud. And the Chatham Islands, cloudy with drizzle turning to rain late tomorrow. It's eight past five and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thanks Katrina. Tonight, Bill English on Todd Barclay, who kept his job and kept the support of people in the know for the best part of 18 months before he resigned suddenly yesterday. So what's changed? That's next. Also coming up, Theresa May says, sorry, the All Blacks and the Lions named their teams for Saturday's first test. And John Gerritsen looks for cake in preschools. But first up tonight, Labour is being accused of hypocritical behaviour after the party's foreign interns complained about substandard living conditions. About 90 international interns were staying at an Auckland marae as part of a programme called Campaign for Change. The programme, described as non-partisan, was run by Labour's former Chief of Staff, Matt McCartan, with the approval of Labour's Auckland office. Here's our political reporter, May Heron. This is an unwelcome story for the Labour Party, especially given it comes as pressure is ramping up on National and its leader, Bill English, over the handling of the Todd Barclay controversy. Not only that, but Labour has been pushing for a crackdown on cheap foreign student labour. Its leader, Andrew Little, acknowledges it's embarrassing for the party. It looks to me like it's got wildly out of control. The people have now found they can't manage it. The party's headquarters has found out about it um, and they've now stepped in to take control of it. The interns, who were mainly from the United States, were staying at Awataha Marae in Auckland. The news website Politic has photos of cramped dormitories, broken and unusable showers, doors hanging off hinges and unfinished construction work with material piled beside mattresses. The Labour Party found out about the complaints and took over the campaign run by Matt McCartan. 
In a statement, Mr McCartan says he is no longer part of the program and the problems arose because there were many more interns than were initially planned for. The interns were not paid but were given free accommodation and expenses. Labor's General Secretary Andrew Curtin says some of the interns were concerned about the kind of work they were expected to do, such as door knocking for the party. I was aware of some issues around quality of the accommodation and also the capacity of Matt McCartan to manage and run the programme effectively given the number of people that were uh, over here and that's why we've stepped in to, um, to sort that out. Mr Curtin says some interns want to go home and the party will contribute to those expenses. He says Labour is also planning to move all of them out of the Marae. Andrew Little wouldn't be drawn into who was to blame for the situation. There will have to be a review and go back and see how it got to this point and then I think you know, to the extent we have to point fingers of blame uh, and, and who takes responsibility for what. RNZ tried to speak to some of the interns who were staying at Awataha Marae but were told to leave the premises by a spokesman. He refused to give his name or tell us what his role was with the students. The Māori Party co-leader, Marama Fox, says Labour needs to be more transparent and let media see the conditions the interns were living in. I don't think it's appropriate. I think that they um, talked all yesterday about a cover-up. This, there is a stench in the air and it's a stench of hypocrisy and if they say one thing then they should do it. I mean what laws have been broken here? Immigration laws? Employment laws? Lucky they're so close to the unions because the unions have stood up today and said they'd help them out if they need it. The interns are here on working tourist visas. The ACT Party leader, David Seymour, says Immigration New Zealand must investigate. The Labour Party ostensibly stands for rights for workers, cracking down on student immigrants and paying the minimum wage. Uh, when it comes to their own campaign, they're not only not doing those things, they're doing the opposite. Labour says some of the interns have stayed on and will be sent to work on party campaigns in other parts of the country. Labour and former union boss Andrew Little will be hoping they don't hit the headlines again. From Parliament for Checkpoint, May Heron. And we'll talk to Andrew Little himself after the news at six. Yesterday afternoon, having shown no sign of doing so 18 hours earlier or in the 18 preceding months, Todd Barclay tendered his resignation effective in September. He didn't do so last year as Glenis Dixon resigned from his electorate office, as Stuart Davey resigned as his electorate chairman, as Bill English became aware of a secret dictaphone recording, even speaking to the police about it. And the police conducted an investigation that Todd Barclay himself declined to exist. Sorry, assist, but he did step down yesterday. Why? What's changed? Todd Barclay won't talk to us, although the invitation remains open. But today, Bill English was visiting a drug and alcohol rehabilitation centre in West Auckland, and afterwards he held a media conference. So I went. Good morning. Good morning, Prime Minister. Prime Minister, in February of last year, you texted Stuart Davey about Todd Barclay, and I quote, he left a dictaphone running that picked up all conversations in the office. Why did he survive then and go yesterday? What's changed? Well, the, he, that was in the context of a, an employment dispute. Uh, while now there is an understanding that that was potentially an offence at the time, that was not the case. But you spoke to the police about it in April, so that was absolutely being treated as a possible offence. Well, that was later when there had been a police complaint made. Uh, but in the early stages of this particular argument, um, there was an employment dispute going on. Uh, there was a settlement of that employment dispute and a confidentiality agreement around it. And to all intents and purposes, that looked to be the end of the matter. Isn't the thing that has changed that this is now embarrassing the National Party, that at the time, last year, this was behind closed doors. Now it is very much in public, and that's why Todd Barclay had to go. Well, the reason, uh, I mean, he's made a, a brave decision for a young guy in politics, um, decided that the position he got himself into was untenable, uh, that it didn't work uh, as a distraction from the government's focus on the issues that matter to the public, Thomas. rather than rather than the internal uh, internal debate about what he was what he'd done or might do. But if it's untenable now, why was it tenable? in February, March and April of last year. Why was it tenable when he was being reselected as the candidate for Clutha Southland? What has suddenly made it untenable? Well, in our, in our party, the selection process is totally devolved. It is totally the responsibility of the electorate. Uh, the actions I had taken were to 
pass the information I had to the electorate chair. The electorate chair is the person who runs the selection, uh, which occurred actually sometime, quite some time later. Uh, I, I made a decision not to be part of the selection. I had no formal role in it. I couldn't be a voter or a delegate as part of it, uh, and came to the view that the former MP becoming involved in this election, particularly one that was contested in this way, uh, would probably polarise it in a way that was worse. Uh, so, But all the information was available. I mean, these issues had been canvassed publicly in the media, uh, certainly known by all the delegates, because among the delegates were people who, uh, as I understand it, were part of this whole process. Prime Minister, I'm struck, though, and all you say is true, but I'm struck by the fact that that is a micro-semantics argument. I'm really interested in, did you regard Todd Barclay's behaviour as tenable, as acceptable, as appropriate in February, March and April of last year? And if you didn't, why didn't you speak up against it? Well, it was, uh, and it was not, it wasn't acceptable behaviour in the sense of it led to a, an employment dispute uh, with a, you know, including with people that I had, who'd worked for me, who I regarded as quite competent. Uh, that was resolved then in the correct way, which was between the employer and the employee, the employer being uh, parliamentary services and the employee. And uh, <coughs> that's, and then subject to a confidentiality agreement. So uh, my advice to him was that that wasn't good behaviour. Uh, in fact, to all the parties involved, that they needed that they could behave better. What wasn't good behaviour? Secretly recording conversations in the office? Well, there was, you know, a whole, there was a number of allegations around, and those have all been discussed publicly. Uh, but uh, as someone who was not party to all that, uh, the employment, the resolution of the employment dispute uh, seemed at the time to deal with whatever the differences were, and I, I don't, I'm not aware of all the differences, uh, and uh, whatever uh, actions he had taken that weren't acceptable. So if they dealt with them at the time, why did Todd Barclay go yesterday? I don't understand what's changed. If the employment dispute was resolved satisfactorily at the time, and if you and John Key and other senior members of the National Party saw fit to not tackle Todd Barclay directly about what he had been doing, why did he have to go yesterday? Well, I, I disagree with that. This is someone whose actions have been investigated over many months by the police, right? So the information I had uh, was part of the police investigation. Uh, the, the sort of the inference that nothing happened is wrong. There isn't, there couldn't really be a much more serious process than the one that was initiated by a complaint to the police about the recording, raising a set of issues around offences, which I don't think anyone had occurred to anybody that there may be some potential offence. Did it not occur to you when you were speaking to the police? Well, by the time there was a police complaint, then you could see the possibility that there was an offence. But earlier on, um, I mean, who, you know, for those who weren't involved, it's hard to know what exactly happened. There was no implication of behaviour that could be an offence. But uh, and nevertheless, the, whatever was part of the employment dispute, there was a police complaint. Um, the information I had I made available to the police did, did through the police their... Approach you? Did the that... police approach you or did you approach the police over this? Oh no, they approached me. So the actions of Mr Barclay weren't, um, were dealt with in the context of a police investigation which is the most serious framework in which the actions of a politician can be investigated. So if all of that is true, why did he stand down yesterday? Well, look. In the end, these aren't these decisions aren't just legal, uh, or just political. They're also personal. Isn't the, so isn't the difference? Isn't the difference that he was caught out? Isn't the difference that you have been caught out? Isn't the difference fundamentally that everyone who knew about this was quite content for Todd Barclay to stay until this became explicitly public? Well, the people who determine whether he stayed in Parliament is his local electorate. And I think that's a pretty important point here need to, that needs to be understood. The uh, caucus, the leadership, the party head office doesn't determine the selections. The candidate is selected 
only by the local electorate and the history of that is that interference from outside in that process always leads to trouble. Uh, so he had gone through, it's not a matter of people being happy with things not being known, in fact uh, this whole situation was very well understood in the electorate as I understand. The piece of information I had had been in the hands of the electorate chairman who ran this election and had been for many months. Uh, the, uh, so the people re-selected Todd Barclay uh, in when there'd been a police investigation that a police investigation of the actions which did not come to a conclusion, right? It basically said the investigation's over, we're not laying charges of any sort. Uh, in the knowledge of that, then the local national party selected a candidate. So it was about as transparent and thoroughly investigated a process as you could possibly imagine. In fact, I can't recall a candidate selection uh, that occurred after a police investigation. Bill English. Now, the Prime Minister doesn't think the recording scandal has damaged his personal reputation or that of the government. At least that's what he's saying publicly. So do people on the streets of Auckland agree with him? I mean, it's pretty shocking. It's not great for election year for anyone, but um, I suppose that's when all the dirt comes out. I don't think it's going to change much. I mean, you're going to have to come out with a, a pretty big smoking gun for, um, for anything to happen to National at this point, eh? I think he, he lied something once, and now to hide that lie, is some, he's just doing some more lies and lies and lies. Is it going to change my vote? No. Is it going to change, ch change anyone else's? Certainly not enough to swing the election, I don't think. If they're doing things like this, that's pretty big. Uh, those comments from the streets of Auckland earlier this afternoon. It's 22 minutes past five. Coming up on Checkpoint, a bolter from the Blues. Rico Yoni gets uh, a call up for the All Blacks. Joe Porter is sitting beside us to discuss this. While weather hits the north, the Kaikohe principal says she hasn't seen flooding like it in almost 50 years. She started at the school when she was five. Don't forget, you can text us on 2101. We'd love your feedback on the Labour interns and on Todd Barclay. Not resigning for so long and then stepping down. As people are pointing out, he hasn't resigned. He's just said... He is not seeking re-election come September. You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ. You can text us to 101 and you can email us at checkpoint at radioNZ.co.nz. The All Blacks and Lions have named, today's, uh, have named today their squads for Saturday's first test against Eden Park, which I am picking will be a cracker <laughs> of a game. Joe Porter. You were there today at the namings. Let's start with the All Blacks. What was what were the talking points? Well, like you said, a bolter from the Blues, Rico Iwane, 20-year-old wing. New Zealand seven stock, of course, New Zealand Māori, a fantastic talent, but no one was 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 expecting him to be thrust into this cauldron that will be this test on Saturday night, this early in his career. Steve Hansen has taken what we think is a punt, however, he denies that. Ioane's inclusion over 53 test veteran Julian Savia certainly raised some eyebrows, but of course Hansen, he denies that this is a gamble. Now the Blues working through the phases. Farmerina moves it on, pedal feather, floats a lovely ball out. Ioane heading for the corner, and Rico Ioane scores. Off a beautiful pass by the rookie, Stephen Pettel. Rico Iwane scored with just about his first touch of the ball for the Blues against the Lions earlier this month and cut capers all game. Coach Steve Hansen says he's ready for the cauldron of Lions rugby. We saw plenty in the Blues game that suggested that he will bother them if he gets given a bit of space. And it doesn't need a lot because he's good on his feet and he's quick. So, But if you just cast your mind back to our, our test match against France, he got chucked in the deep end pretty early. And he, he showed a lot of mental fortitude in that game. I thought he played really outstandingly well. So that's another indicator that we think he can cope with. And Hansen denies he's picked the prodigy on a hunch. No, we don't think we're taking a hunch. We think he is more than ready to do the job we want him to do. Otherwise, we wouldn't have put him out there. And, you know, that is the same with every team we select. We don't put people out there that we think can't cope. You know, like he has to have something to be going in there ahead of two really, really good players. Ioane's lineage is one of sporting prowess. His mum played for the Black Ferns and his dad Auckland and Manu Samoa. His older brother Akira is his Blues and New Zealand Māori teammate. There's no substitute for raw speed and All Blacks first five Bowden Barrett says Ioane has it in spades. He was the fastest this morning at speed testing so I'm very excited for Rico. Um, playing against him is, is tough, so to see him, uh, you know, on the same side uh, this weekend, it's pretty exciting. 
Ioane is joined in the back line by midfielder Ryan Crotty, who's been picked alongside Sonny Bill Williams, pushing the inform Anton Leonard Brown to the bench. Crotty hasn't played since the start of the month after injuring his ribs, but he's been picked to counter the Lions' rush defence, where Hanson hopes his experience and calmness under pressure will pay dividends. Crotty says the Lions' defensive line speed can also work in the All Blacks' favour. It creates opportunity with, with the line speed. It certainly puts um, your skill set under pressure, but it still leaves space to attack. So that's the way they've defended. And we're probably lucky we've had a good opportunity to, to look at that and, and come up with plans to negate it. While Crotty hasn't played in weeks, returning skipper Kieran Reid has hardly played this year. While some might question the number eight's readiness to survive 80 minutes of test rugby against the bruising Lions forwards, Crotty says Reid is no normal man. He's our fearless leader, isn't he? If anyone can do it, a reader can. Um, I know he's been working blimmin' hard. He's as mentally tough as anyone, and um, he'll be up for it, no doubt. And I can't wait to see him go, because when he's at the top of his game, he's the best in the world. And with the Lions certain to try and strangle the All Blacks out of the match, they'll need their captain courageous at his very best. For Checkpoint, Joe Porter. Joe, it's lovely to have you in here with us. That is the Lions game plan, isn't it? Just to suffocate, to smother. Absolutely. And, and I know lots of our colleagues are moaning about that and saying, boy, it's boring rugby. Yeah. I, 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 I relish the prospect. Oh, absolutely. But, but because the, the Lions suffocated the Crusaders, they suffocated the Māori, and they can do this, and they can win games doing this, right? Absolutely. Uh, anyone that thinks this will be a one-sided contest doesn't know. This is going to be a real grudge match. This is going to be like a World Cup final. The Lions are going to try and engage the All Blacks in a dual battle, forward-orientated, and like you said, try and choke them out of the match. It'll be a fascinating contrast between two styles of play. High tempo, high intensity, high speed All Blacks, looking to score tries, put people away into space. Whereas the Lions are rush, flat defence, box kicks from halfback Connor Murray, high balls all day. It's very traditional, but it's the best chance they've got of winning, and boy, oh boy, they're going to give it a hell of a shot. And they've picked the team to play that game, have they? Absolutely. The forward pack is unchanged, essentially, from the Crusaders and the Māori. They've made one or two sort of uh, leadership changes within that group, but the back row of Sean O'Brien, Peter O'Mahony, and the Welsh number eight, Toby Falato, have been picked. Yeah. They just crushed the Crusaders' back row, stopped a team that has scored five tries on average this year a game. They just were scoreless against the Lions. So, absolutely. And the back line is what Gatlin's thrown a few surprises. A couple of players that are play more running rugby than what you might expect. Lee Halfpenny can kick goals from anywhere at, at fullback. Mm. He's been left out. So there are indications that perhaps they will run it slightly more, but let's be honest, they are going to try and strangle them like they've done with that forward pack that is brutish, is big, it dominates... And let's just see if the All Blacks can break down this defence. It should be fascinating. Joe Porter, our rugby reporter. Thanks so much, Joe. We really appreciate it. Two weeks ago on Tuesday, about 200 metres away from us here at RNZ in Auckland, a 34-year-old man was hit by a car. Daniel Copper died two days later, a fortnight ago today. In the days that followed, we learned he was a father of four little girls, the oldest aged just five. And then we watched in amazement as a give a little account opened by friends received donation after donation after donation. The amount donated now stands at $129,000. And much of it has come from people who'd never met Daniel. And Dan's wife, Kelly, who met him and fell in love with him at school, wanted to say how much it's all meant to her, the kindness of family, of friends, and most unexpectedly of all, of strangers. I went to see Kelly at home with three of their four children and with her wonderful mum and dad, aka Popper. I don't even know how to put it into words, but it's been incredible. Um, from the give a little page and even like yesterday I came home and there was two boxes of nappies just delivered. I don't even know who they're from, you know, just... Just at your front door? Yeah, just at the front door. And, um, you don't know who put them there? No, oh, well, I know a career company did, but I don't know where they... Yum. <laughs> oh, where, yum, look at who, that. Who ordered them. And just... Um, but the strain, like, and reading the messages from people and, like, even... And it, you, at the beginning, when it first happened, it really helped get me through and how every night before I fell asleep, I'd read them just to kind of, in some ways... Popper, what a nice popper. We'll go for a walk to the shop. Actually. Are you going to the shop? Yeah. Are you? Yeah. What are you going to buy? I'll buy chocolate. Oh, chocolate. <laughs> Can you bring me some back? Good girl, thanks so much, shall we? Right, go, right. Popper. You all set? Yeah. 
It really helped me to disconnect in some ways from what was happening and just um because like, if I was living because I was living it so it helped me see it through other people's I, I don't even know how to explain it but it helped me to cope I guess and like I, I one I remember one lady said oh this was the, all that she had in her account and it was something like twelve dollars sixty or it was an odd number and I just I felt overwhelmed by it and I remember saying to someone give it back give it back you know like it's it's really hard to just take the generosity of people, but words don't express kind of what it means either. It's such a terrible thing to lose the man you love as much as you and Dan loved each other, and it's such a terrible thing to lose the father of your beautiful children. Yeah. But the kindness. Uh, it's made it all... What we've been surrounded in, from friends and family, and they've just come in and surrounded us with it. From something that, as awful as it's been, and I wish I wasn't living it, it's made it bearable, but it's made it more than bearable. It's almost made it special in some way. Like, um, yeah, and I, I don't kind of like to think of my husband's death as special because... I'd give anything to have him back and be arguing with him again, <laughs> anything. But it's made it, yeah, it's really, I look back on it and I think it was, you know, it's been a special time. It's been a life-changing time, but it's been, and they've helped me keep my head above water through, through all of it. And, um, and I didn't expect it. I don't know, you never think about it, but I just didn't expect it either. So at times it was really overwhelming. The feeling, because there's no words to sum it up for me. Like it just, how much it truly means. And like, yeah, and people that don't know the twins that don't have that connection or know our kids or know me or um, that didn't know Dan, but they've just, you know, taken the time to even, let alone money, but taking the time to write the message. Even some of the messages I've read on the articles that have been mm -hmm. done, even that, you know, like th those words, I guess people write words and you don't think they mean that much to someone, but they actually do. And they really, they help to get you through things. And this is both emotionally and in, in terms of your heart and your loss, but also financially. And this is a difficult conversation to have, but Dan had a kind of pre-existing blood condition, right? He did, yeah. Which made it very difficult and extremely expensive for him to get life insurance. It did. And, and we're in your beautiful home, but like all young people who are in the position of owning a home, you yeah. have a mortgage. And so you not only were going to lose, well, lost your husband, but your home was at risk. So, so the donations have actually... They, I guess people didn't realise that, um, people have given this and didn't realise that he didn't have life insurance. So, and one of my first thoughts was, how am I going to do it? You know, like, it's just, I just can't thank people, our friends and our family, but and the, all the strangers, and, and they don't feel like strangers anymore though, but people that didn't know us. I can't thank them enough, and I'll never be able to, never. Kelly Cleland talking about the immense and extraordinary kindness of strangers since her husband Daniel was killed out on Hobson Street a fortnight ago. With Checkpoint on RNZ, thank you for being with us. It's 26 to 6. Coming up on the program, it's now Plan B for a plan to take control of Dunedin's Cadbury factory. An apology from Theresa May over the Grenfell Tower tragedy. Uh, should early childcare centres be able to serve up birthday cake? Andrew Little is with us after 6. Sharon Brett Kelly has business news next, but before all of that, Katrina Batten with the headlines. The police say they'll decide next week whether to reopen an investigation into the Clutha Southland MP's secret recording of electorate staff.
Their comment is part of the fallout over National MP Todd Barclay that's led to the Prime Minister Bill English today rejecting allegations of a cover-up. Winston Peters has filed two privileges complaints against the Prime Minister because of his comments about the incident. The Labour Party admits it's been embarrassing to have dozens of interns brought to New Zealand to campaign for the party complain about substandard living conditions. The 90 interns, mainly Americans, came here as part of the party's campaign for change programme. Labour's leader Andrew Little says he's disappointed how this has played out and other accommodation has been arranged. A Kai boy couple wants to know who mistakenly water blasted their roof, spreading harmful asbestos dust and causing thousands of dollars worth of damage. Donna Somervale returned home from work one day in April and discovered her roof had mysteriously been stripped clean and that dust from the asbestos coating had been spread around her property. A school principal who submitted a false performance appraisal with her husband's signature on it has lost her teacher registration. Jenny Leach was the principal of Ferguson Intermediate for 22 years and gave her school's board of trustees the fake appraisal three years ago. She signed the appraisal with the electronic signature of her husband, former King's College principal Mike Leach. The government has announced plans to burn millions of old tyres each year to help manufacture cement. The Environment Minister Nick Smith says piles of unused tyres all over the country are a fire hazard, leach contaminants, breed, uh, provide a breeding ground for rodents and insects and blot the landscape. Using them as a heat source instead of coal would alleviate this problem and also lower greenhouse gas emissions. Those are the headlines. I'm back at six. Thank you so much, Katrina. Sitting beside me doing... Business news today, having been fronting checkpoint last week, is Sharon Brett Kelly. Hi, Sharon. Hi, John. Reserve Bank kept its official cash rate at a record low. That's right, 1.75%. No surprises there, John. The Reserve Bank Governor, Graham Wheeler, saying using the phrase numerous uncertainties are still out there in the economy. Numerous uncertainties, don't you love that? Uh, so what he's saying, global economic growth has increased, but still major challenges like this widespread political uncertainty. In New Zealand, GDP growth in the March quarter was lower than expected. Uh, the weaker export volumes and residential construction partially offset by stronger consumption. But he's saying that the growth outlook remains positive, supported by, here's another phrase, accommodative monetary policy, uh, strong population growth and higher terms of trade. In the housing area, and that's the big thing with the, with the economy at the moment, um, loan-to-value ratio restrictions, these various restrictions that are around tighter lending restrictions, uh, keeping the, the house price inflation down, but he's saying that um, that there is a risk of resurgence in the price because of the demand, particularly in Auckland. Um, so overall, it's playing down expectations yeah. while, and this is what I'm being told, while it's making that gentle transition from the regime of Graham Wheeler to the next governor. Now, Graham Wheeler ends his term in September. That's just before the rate decision of that month. And Grant Spencer, who's his deputy at the moment, he's stepping in and he's going to be the acting governor until a new one is appointed around about March next year. And it's about that time that economists are saying that the Reserve Bank is going to have to start thinking about changing its tone. Uh, right now it's keeping a lid on things, inflation, house prices slowing down. In nine months time things are expected to start picking up and so that neutral uh, tone is about to change and that's the time that the new person comes yeah. in. And so economists are saying uh, Expect interest rates to maybe start going up by the middle of next year. Okay. So Graham Wheeler is effectively using numerous uncertainties, and I think everyone agree, would agree that that is the case, and you mm. don't have to look far to find them. No. He, he, he's leaving the pitch clear for his replacement, isn't he? Yeah. Right. Okay. That's exactly what he's doing. Yeah. yeah. To sum it all up, yeah, yeah that's which, what he's doing. Which is quite classy of him in a way, Sharon, isn't it? Well, I suppose it is, yes. John. Yeah, what depending on who you talk to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, he's had his critics, hasn't he? He sure he's had, has. had quite a tough time. Yeah. What's happened on the markets today? So the top 50 index closed up 36 points to 75.64. The New Zealand dollar is at 72.54 US cents and 96 Australian. Sharon Brett Kelly, Renaissance woman, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. It's Plan B now for a crowd-funded initiative that wants to take control of Dunedin's Cadbury factory. Jim O'Malley withdrew his own the factory campaign from bidding.
committing to keep making pineapple lumps and jaffas and so on in Dunedin, saying the global owner Mondelez was impossible to work with. But he's got a backup plan, and it appears the public, which has pledged almost $6 million to the project, is right behind him. With more on this, here's our Otago Southland reporter, Ian Telfer. Oh, my God, I've just opened up my website. Email, I've got probably 200 emails in there now. that have come in in the last hour. This morning, after Jim O'Malley emailed all his chocolate factory pledges to say he was pulling out of the bidding for a Mondelez contract, but was working on a new business case for a chocolate factory, he was deluged with responses most of which were positive. I, mean, I think that's what we're going to get. It's going to be, essentially, most people are going to say, provided it's sound, provided you're still going in the same direction, we'll stay with you because the reason they came to this in the first place was, was bigger than just winning third-party manufacturing and pineapple lumps. One of those pledges is Dunedin man Glenn Babington. He's promised $1,500 for his piece of the chocolate-making dream. Basically, I think it's actually a really good business opportunity and it's also keeping the business local as well. So rather than us losing jobs and seeing industry go to overseas, it's a chance to keep things local and, um, you know, to have the money going back to the community as well if we own it. Mr Babington says he's not worried or surprised that Dr O'Malley's had to pull out. He says his investment might be a bit more risky, but it's worth it for the freedom. If we had been in business for somebody else, we probably would have been uh, at, you know, their whims would have um, affected us where now we're totally in control. So it's a bit harder to get started perhaps, but I think long term it is actually healthier. Mondelez was cool on Dr O'Malley's plan from the start, progressively suggesting in statements there were too many hurdles for it to jump over to get the manufacturing contract. This week it was reported Mondelez staff warned its Dunedin factory workers to be careful about investing in the plan. Dr O'Malley says that attitude and the company's inflexibility about its processes and timeline made it impossible to continue bidding. The Labor MP for Dunedin South, Claire Curran, says she's gutted because Mondelez seems to have acted with bad faith. The whole point of this exercise was for Mondelez to uh, leave Dunedin, to exit Dunedin with um, a good taste in everybody's mouth, literally. Um, and I'm, I fear that it's going to be the opposite uh, and that what has a huge amount of community support um, is, is not likely to get off the ground now um, because of inflexibility and, and that's so disappointing. The chief executive of the Otago Southland Employers Association, Virginia Nichols, says it would have been a big call for Mondelez to go with an untested, crowd-funded company. I think in fairness to, um, to Mondelez, I think they've got a very good process in place, but they do need someone there pretty much up and going by sort of April next year, which is not that far away. So what happens now to pineapple lumps? There are still two bidders for the contract, one believed to be Rainbow Confectionery in Oamaru, where pineapple lumps were invented. The company won't comment. But Oamaru's mayor, Gary Kircher, says he's confident they'll bring the lumps home. We've got a you know, great company with Rainbow. They've got the capacity to do it and they've got the ability to do it. So um, really we're, we're just standing by and uh, we'd certainly support our local business to be able to take it on and, and deliver the goods. It's still early days, but many Otago people are now hoping this saga will send the lumps to Oamaru and see a brand new chocolate factory in the heart of Dunedin. I o te more checkpoint, ko Ian Telfer, tēnē. Mondelēz wouldn't front for interviews, they don't front for interviews. Just a small personal aside, Mondelēz, you're one of the world's largest snack companies. I read in your, this off your website. Your share price is $44. For goodness sake, surely you can put a spokesperson up. They have, however, sent us a statement saying it cannot have gaps in supply of products to New Zealand consumers and it will continue to work with the two remaining interested Kiwi manufacturers throughout July to see if a viable option exists. It says if it can't, it can make the products in Australia to the same taste and standards. If you continue to ascend standards, statements rather than putting a spokesperson up, I'm going to read them even more poorly than that. We look forward to talking to a person, not just receiving emails. It's 16 minutes to six. Heavy rain in Northland overnight turned rivers, uh, roads into rivers, trapping some people in a dairy and closing a number of schools. Kai Kohe East School Principal Chiki Rudkin told me a heavy downpour this morning saw only 40% of school children turn up, hardy souls, bless them, at school. And the flooding was the worst she'd seen since she started there 48 years ago as a pupil. 
Well, the water this morning was amazing. It was it was just about in the in the um, office here, and I came to school here as a five year old, and I've never seen it like that before and um, one of my staff said oh we need sandbags well you know where are we going to pluck those out of in the middle of a storm Miss Mason I had to reply so um, luckily after about an hour of absolute torrential rain um, it it, it stopped and then the water receded Um, but by then we had to have if you've seen the photo in the Herald um, you'll see along the blue fence there, we had cars parked there at well, about quarter to eight this morning and slowly but surely everybody had to move their car out onto the road because the flooding was just wow. so bad. Yeah, so... And, and, mm. and so you've been there since you were five. <laughs> which, yes. w- which is roughly 21 years ago, right? Yeah, yeah me too. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's me. <laughs> and you've never seen anything like it? No. Wow. No, not at all. And did the rain... F- it wasn't absolutely torrential, was it? Well, it was for about 30 minutes. Um, it rained hard for about an hour, but torrential for about 30 minutes, I'd say. Um, and so our teachers, when they got to school, were trying to track round to room 12 where our kids' gumboots gum are for the gardening club and um, squeeze their little t- toddles into the kids' gumboots and get over to their classrooms. But even the gumboots, you know, the water was yeah, yeah. the gumboots because it was so high in places. How many kids came to school? Um, probably only about 40% of our role today. And my phone was running hot from about half past seven, saying, oh, fire truck, is there school today? Yes, there is. <laughs> and then I got here and thought, oh, what a stupid thing to say, Tricky. You should have told them, no, there's no school. It's too wet. But um, the kids that came out, yes, they're all good and tucked up warm and dry, and the rain stopped. Good work, Tricky. And is the, are the waters going down? Yeah, 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 all good now. We're, um, yeah, we've just got a whole lot of mess around the place, but it's supposed to be a similar situation tomorrow, so... Oh. You know, we'll all be prepared for that. We'll all park on the right side of the car park and wear gumboots to school. Chicky Rudkin, the principal of Kaikohe East School, a man who's been fighting the reckless dumping of used vehicle tyres for years, says he can't wait for a proper disposal system to finally be put in place. A new government scheme will see about 60% of old tyres used as biofuel to make cement, and companies would uh, get council consent for stockpiles of more than 2,500 tyres. That's music to the ears of Patrick Lynch, who's been fighting to stop illegal or just plain chaotic dumping of used tyres for years. Here's Eric Frickberg. Five million vehicle tyres are discarded in New Zealand each year. A few are reused, but many end up in landfills, dumped on roadsides, or heaped in huge piles leaching contaminants and blighting the landscape. Patrick Lynch, who handles this issue nationally from his office in Hamilton, describes one egregious case of tyre dumping at Nike near Huntley. The landowner there would run a truck up to Auckland, pick up end-of-life tyres from the tyre retailers, bring them back to his property and dug very, very big and deep holes and put a lot of tyres under the ground. Patrick Lynch says this man was paid a few dollars per tyre to take them off people's hands. He dumped about a million of them illegally, then vanished overseas. We've got a 20-tonne digger digging down five, six metres into the ground and just drawing out hundreds of tyres that have just been buried right down into the water table. And then around the site there were mounds of many thousands of tyres. In a bid to address this problem, the government is proposing controls on new tyre stockpiles. Local government approval would be needed for stockpiles of more than 2,500 used tyres. Environment Minister Nick Smith says tyre piles pose many risks. The first is the leachate. The contaminants are picked up in the water and that makes its way into the aquifers, the rivers, the lakes. The second problem, accidentally a fire gets started and you have the nightmare for the fire service. You also get mosquitoes and then there's just the straight aesthetics. Dr Smith's plan to fix this will send 60% of old tyres to special plants for shredding and then ship them to Golden Bay Cement near Whangarei. There, the rubber will burn at high temperature, displacing coal as a fuel and saving 13,000 tonnes of CO2 emissions each year. The government is paying $19 million to make this scheme work. Welcoming it is a senior fire service executive, Essie Tawney Paonga, who says rubber fires are very hard to deal with. The most challenging thing for us is getting access because quite often these piles of tyres are in rural and and large outdoor spaces so there's no road access. There are chemicals involved with tyres and then when they do catch fire there's a breakdown to their basic levels and then toxicity definitely is in there. 
Getting rid of these heaps of tyres before they catch fire is sometimes little more than a game of musical chairs. Patrick Lynch explains one such case involving 140,000 tyres and an unscrupulous man. He leased a property in central Hamilton, stockpiled these tyres and walked away. Hamilton City Council have did what they thought to be the right thing at the time and had them removed. Unfortunately the company that did the removal essentially just moved the problem to other areas, Waihi Beach and Kawaro. Some surplus tyres are already used for artificial playing surfaces and Dr Smith is funding several other recycling projects as well. For Checkpoint, core Eric Frickberg, Tene. A Kayapoi couple has been left tens of thousands of dollars out of pocket after their home was mistakenly water blasted, contaminating their property with asbestos. Donna Somerville and Richard Goodwin want the water blasting company to front up and admit they got it wrong. They also want to be cons compensated for the cost of repairing their land, which isn't covered by insurance. They told our Christchurch reporter, Conan Young, they returned home on the Monday before Easter to an almighty mess. Oh, over absolutely everything. Uh, was sort of wet sludgy, so there's grit, it's like somebody, it's like black hail. Um, it, it extended right to the fence line, it was stuck on the fence, over the fence, neighbour's property, out onto the road. And, so, and how did it get there? Uh, it was water blasted off, we told. Yeah, this wasn't water blasting that you guys had ordered? Oh, no, 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 not at all. So, so what, somebody had just turned up and decided to water blast your roof, unbeknownst to you, and, and, and spread this asbestos everywhere? Uh, yeah, apparently, yeah. I mean, clearly, clearly, presumably they didn't know there was asbestos in it, or, uh, and, and our only guess is that they've, um, they'd turned up to the wrong property. And um, uh, our neighbour indicated that, um, or he, he works from home and he saw them, and... Um, uh, indicated that at some point during the during the the exercise, um, they got a phone call or, or a boss turned up or something, and basically everything suddenly shut down very quickly and they and they disappeared. Uh, so yeah, we've got no idea who they were, what they were doing. Um, they certainly weren't there at our request um, or anybody else's that that you know would have had anything to do with the property and um, and clearly they didn't really know what they were doing as far as as far as handling that kind of roof and um, and you know dealing with the potential uh, challenges of it that asbestos might be in there so yeah and, and so the asbestos hadn't just been spread around y your garden and it actually got inside uh, yeah, well, because we had the windows open or a little bit, and um, and just normal movement, um, you know, move, walking in through the paths and and things like that, um, it, it got tracked inside and um, and and blew inside through the through the windows. So there were parts of the house that were were tested and and found to have been contaminated as a result, um, because of some uh, delays with the earthquake repairs um, from September 2010. The uh, we had some uh, 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 leaky roof issues with the um, around the range hood and so on, and so water and rain and so on. In subsequent days, washed more of the stuff um, into those areas and contaminated the uh, the ceiling cavity space as well as the as well as the the, the range and range hood. And so, how uh, have your insurers responded to all of this? They've been pretty good. Um, we're with AMI and they sort of bumped up the chain to IAG. Uh, so we don't really have too many complaints about, about the process. Uh, it's a bit slow and it's been hampered by the fact that we're working with um, Southern Response to get the earthquake claim finished. Uh, the it doesn't cover everything though, does it, the no, insurance? No, it doesn't cover everything. The house insurance doesn't cover damage to the land. And so IAG are, have... have indicated they'll consider a contribution to the cost of clearing the land around the house so the house doesn't need to be doesn't need to be demolished or anything though a lot of extensive repairs but the um, the land as far as we understand it from the from the boundary of the house out to the border of the gardens at least will need to be cleared to a depth of 100 millimeters so scraped to bare dirt um, and so we're waiting on quotes and final tests for that to see what's required and, and, and how much it'll cost. What do you guys want to see happen now? Um, we, want to, we want to find out who, who did the water blasting. I mean, there are a few things to, to think about there because there's, there's the, the exposure that, that the staff had to, to the thing. And, uh, and also, uh, 
we need to look at covering recovering the cost of, of reinstating. So we're hoping that, that if they they um, front up, you know, they have insurance that will help us. You know, their own insurance will help us cover some of those costs. So this is especially for that landscaping that... Yeah, because yeah. we're, we're not sure what the... I mean, the total cost of putting back soil and plants and, and so on, um, you know, reinstating the lawns and, and gardens is... Uh, we don't know what... We've never had the landscape before, so... But, you know, that'll be in the thousands. You know. Look, I mean, this is just the absolute nightmare scenario, isn't it? You come home from work and, and you find this has happened to your place, work you hadn't even ordered. Yeah. I mean, how's this left you guys feeling? Uh, stressed would be an understatement. Just, just gutted. Mm. Got uh, nothing left, really. The, the fact that we were close to closing with Southern Response on the earthquake damage and were then not able to do so and therefore... Um, uh, they have a deadline of, of 30th of June to, to get to contract for managing repairs and we were looking forward to them being able to manage the repairs. Um, so the fact that that wasn't able to happen and we're now dealing with a cash settlement and having to manage the repairs ourselves hasn't been, you know, that's been um, a, a real struggle. And, and the two, because of the, the, the consolidating the work together to, you know, it, it complicates the things an awful lot with the multiple contractors and, and, and so on. Donna Somerville and Richard Goodwin are speaking to our reporter Conan Young after the couple, oh, sorry, and the couple were also burgled after the water blasting, which spread the asbestos further inside the house. If you know who water blasted their Kayapoi home, please contact us on 2101 2101. Anonymous tip offs are uh, uh, received gratefully. Just get in touch, 2101, if you know who was responsible for that. Let them eat cake, except it seems if they're preschoolers. Health Ministry guidelines have prompted many early childhood centres to take cake off their daily menus, but it seems under fives can't even bet on a nice slice of chocolate cake when it's their birthday. Our education correspondent John Gerritsen went out looking for icing and found, believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, sausage cake. When there's a birthday at Adelaide Early Childhood Centre in Wellington, everyone sings happy birthday. <laughs> But team leader Karen O'Leary says there's usually no birthday cake. So we got a bit of feedback from the parents saying, you know, is it perhaps too much cake coming out on multiple occasions? So we shifted the policy to be that only at the fifth birthday or at a leaving party, cake would be fine. And you could bring whatever you like for those parties, but at other times then you would just bring things like, you know, plain popcorn, fruit kebabs, that kind of thing. I hear you have an unusual type of cake sometimes when it's your birthday. Yeah, well, I do have a bit of a tradition, John. Um, I actually don't really like sweet things, so I have a sausage cake every year, and that's quite good because the people that don't like sugar don't care about sausage cake, so I can have that every year without any sort of issues. What sausage cake? Well, it's a really delicious cake, John. It's basically made up of sausage meat, which is very good for you, um, and it comes with a delicious tomato sauce icing. Tomato sauce icing? Yeah, that's yeah, that's the icing. Candles in it. It's really nice and hot. Yeah, it pays dividends. Yeah, you, you like it? You eat it to the children? Yeah, well, some of them, you know. It's Again, it's like other cakes. They generally just eat the icing and throw the rest away. Sausage cake isn't on the menu at Little Wonders Wellington Centre and its chef, Kim Cunnington, says not all cake is created equal. We do serve cake, but cake is a um, different meaning to cake because it's packed with sunflower seeds and pumpkin seeds. So you're tricking them? Um, well, no, because not all cake needs to be filled with icings and sugars and so we use a lot of natural fresh sugars with the proteins of the seeds to balance it. Yeah, and the kids are happy with that? They, you don't ever get them saying, oh, you know, I want a slice with a bit of icing on it? No, kids are more than happy, more than happy. Some children take a little while to adapt and then, and then they're used to it. The head teacher, Sarah Jimison, says there is such a thing as too much cake. You can be serving cakes quite regularly when you have birthdays every week. They might be getting cake three or four times a week and things like that. So what we do is we make it more of a focus around the individual child and how that's a special day for them and we're celebrating them rather than having a focus around food. At Hill Street Early Childhood Centre, parents often bring fruit instead of a cake for their child's birthday. But the head teacher, Claire Yongapir, says cake is OK sometimes because children need to learn about making good decisions with food. We don't eliminate every single unhealthy food because we want children to know that that's a treat and that you know if they are going to be having experiences in their lives where they have these options to whether they have treats or healthy food, we want them to be making those decisions about you know, treats are just for occasions, but healthy food is, is what we should be eating day to day. It seems all things are good in moderation, 
maybe even sausage cake. For Checkpoint, John Gerritsen. I quite like the idea of sausage cake. Mm, sausage cake. Sausage cake, very nice. Uh, it's 28 seconds, 27 seconds, 26. I could just keep doing that until 6 o'clock, couldn't I? Away from the news at 6. We're getting lots and lots of feedback tonight. Thank you. Pips just said, read some of it. Bill English and National should admit they did the thing in not showing Barclay the door last year. Take responsibility for handling it badly instead of making excuses about it. It's 6 o'clock. RNZ News at 6. Ngamihi Nui, good evening. Ko Katrina Batanaho. The fallout over National MP Todd Barclay is continuing, with the Prime Minister rejecting allegations of a cover-up. Dogged by controversy over secretly recording a former electorate staffer, the MP for Clutha Southland will stand down at the election. Opposition MPs have accused Mr English of a cover-up after he allowed Mr Barclay to stay on as a member of the caucus when he knew what had gone on. Mr English says he passed on the information he had to party officials and the police. The police are reassessing information that's come to light this week and will decide whether to reopen the investigation next week. The New Zealand First Leader says the Prime Minister has made misleading statements to Parliament about Todd Barclay and should resign. Winston Peters says he's laid formal complaints with the Speaker of the House about Bill English's statements on the matter. The Prime Minister in the House yesterday made a statement that was demonstrably not true. He said he had no knowledge of the settlement and the hush fund. And then you look at the um, text he's been sending to the electric chairperson and it's clear as daylight that he knew all about it. Winston Peters. The Labour Party admits it's been embarrassing to have dozens of interns brought to New Zealand to campaign for the party complain about substandard living conditions. Ninety, mainly Americans, were staying on Auckland's Awataha Marae. The news website Politic has photos of cramped dormitories, broken and unusable showers, doors hanging off hinges and unfinished construction work with material piled beside mattresses. Labour's leader Andrew Little says he's disappointed how this has played out and they're now looking after the interns. The Marae's chief executive, Anthony Wilson, rejects the complaint that the facilities are substandard but admits they're not a five-star hotel. He says it's fine if the interns move to different accommodation and wishes them all the best for the future as many of them have become their friends. Federated Farmers has elected a woman as president for the first time in its 118-year history. The West Coast dairy farmer Katie Milne succeeds William Ralston, who stepped down after his three-year tenure. Ms Milne has previously been on the board of the Farmers Lobby Group and president of its West Coast arm and was Dairy Woman of the Year in 2015. The Manawatu dairy farmer Andrew Hoggard has been elected vice president. The inquest into the death of 18-year-old Christy Marceau has adjourned for two weeks, with the coroner thanking the Marceau family for their attendance. As well as giving evidence, Christy's parents, Brian and Tracy, have sat through two weeks of testimony from 20 witnesses. Edward Gay reports from the Auckland District Court. Coroner Catherine Grieg expressed her sympathy to the Marceaus for the loss of their daughter, who was killed by 18-year-old Akshay Chand, while he was out on bail for kidnapping her at knife point in 2011. Coroner Greig said she would endeavour to release her decision as soon as possible. Mrs Marceau told the coroner that they had been waiting for six years and were not going away. The inquest has adjourned until July the 7th, when Dr Jeremy Skipworth, the clinica director of the Mason Clinic, is due to give evidence. Atui te kōti arohi o tamaki makaurau, ko Edward Gayaho. The American President Donald Trump says he intends to bring in new legislation to prevent immigrants from claiming welfare for at least five years after entering America. He hasn't given specific details about the move, but says it will be put into action shortly. Mr Trump was speaking to a rally of supporters in Cedar Rapids in Ohio, Iowa. Others don't treat us fairly. That's why I believe the time has come for new immigration rules which say that those seeking admission into our country must be able to support themselves financially and should not use welfare for a period of at least five years. Donald Trump spoke for more than an hour at the rally in Cedar Rapids. 
One of the investors in a plan to buy Dunedin's Cadbury factory says he's glad they're out of the bidding. Jim O'Malley this morning withdrew his Own the Factory campaign from bidding for a contract from Cadbury's owner Mondelez to keep making pineapple lumps and jaffers in New Zealand. His campaign has gathered nearly $6 million in public pledges. One of the pledges, Glyn Babington, says Mr Dr O'Malley has done the right thing. If we had been in business for somebody else, we probably would have been uh, at, you know, their whims would have um, affected us where now we're totally in control. So it's a bit harder to get started perhaps, but I think long term it is actually healthier. Glenn Babington says he put in $1,500 and he would have pledged more if he could afford it. It's five past six. In sport, the British and Irish Lions coach Warren Gatlin says he's not letting his opposite, Steve Hansen, get inside his head on the eve of the first test at Eden Park on Saturday. Both Hansen and Gatlin made a couple of selection surprises for Saturday's game. Hansen picked Rico Ioane at left wing over Julian Savia, while Gatlin picked Welshman Leon Williams at fullback, while repeatedly saying he thought he was more of a winger. The two coaches have also thrown barbs at each other through the media in the lead up to the match. But Gatlin says it's time for Hanson to stop talking. We know it's going to be a tough encounter and let's let the rugby do the talking because there's been enough trash talk already and I think for all of us get, get excited about this could be a fantastic series for both the Lions and for, for New Zealand rugby and for the New Zealand public. Lions coach Warren Gatland. The retiring New Zealand cricketer Luke Ronke says one of his greatest pleasures was to play alongside two of the best captains in the game. 36-year-old Ronke has retired from international cricket after playing four tests, 85 one-day internationals and 32 T20 internationals for New Zealand. Ronke says the 2015 World Cup when New Zealand made the final was a career highlight, but on a more personal level he enjoyed playing with Brendan McCullum and Kane Williamson. Ronke plans to continue playing on the domestic T20 circuit around the world and for Wellington. That's the news. Tonight on Nights, the Australian Law Reform Commission wants to give banks the responsibility to protect vulnerable customers from financial abuse. So how are they planning to do that, considering around 9% of older people living in the community could be being abused financially? In our Nights Culture Spot, RNZ Concert Sound Lounge host Charlotte Wilson raises the baton on contemporary classical music as well as recent releases of old masters. Our Changing World finds out about Lab on a Chip and there's the pocket edition of Music 101 and more tonight on Nights after RNZ National. At service weather through to midnight tomorrow, Northland to Waitom or also Coromandel and Bay of Plenty, showers, some possibly heavy and thundery. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, rain with some heavy falls, easing to a few showers tomorrow. Taranaki in the central high country to Kapiti, also Wairarapa, occasional rain easing to a few showers early tomorrow. Wellington, Marlborough, Nelson and Buller, periods of rain, clearing Buller tomorrow morning. Canterbury and coastal Otago, periods of rain or drizzle, snow down to 800 metres today. The remainder of Otago also Westland, Fiordland and Southland, mainly fine with variable high cloud. The Chatham Islands cloudy with drizzle, turning to rain late tomorrow. It is almost eight past six and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thanks, Katrina Batten. Andrew Little coming up uh, shortly. But the Prime Minister is rejecting allegations he and senior National Party figures were complicit in a cover-up of the Clutha Southland MP Todd Barclay and what was going on in his office, dogged by controversy over the secret recording of a former electorate staffer. Mr Barclay will stand down as an MP at the election. But the political damage has reached the highest levels of government. As Mr English defends his actions over the past 18 months after he found out about the recording and a confidentiality settlement, he's now had to correct a statement he made to Parliament about a statement he made to the police. He's also the subject of two privileges complaints lodged by New Zealand First Leader Winston Peters with the Speaker. Here's our political editor, Jane Patterson. The police investigated Todd Barclay after a complaint the first term MP had secretly recorded Glenis Dixon in the Gore electorate office. But they hit a brick wall after he refused to cooperate and closed the investigation without laying any charges. Opposition MPs have accused Mr English of a cover-up after he allowed Mr Barclay to remain on as an MP and as a member of the National Party caucus when he knew what had gone on. Mr English says he passed on the information he had to party officials and the police. This is someone whose actions have been investigated over many months by the police, right? So the information I had 
was part of the police investigation. The sort of the inference that nothing happened is wrong. Mr English was texting the electorate chairman Stuart Davey on February the 21st last year about the recording, but the Prime Minister only made a statement to the police when he was approached by them when they were investigating Ms Dixon's complaint. In Parliament there was an exchange between Labour's Grant Robertson and Jerry Brownlee speaking on behalf of Bill English about the chain of events. Does he stand by his statement in the House yesterday, quote, the states, statements made to me regarding regarding this were reported to the relevant party official, that is on the record, and then to the police. It is a weird, weird world when the Labour Party says that reporting a matter to the police is a cover-up. The Honourable Jerry Brownlee on behalf uh, of the Mr. Prime Speaker, Minister. Mr Speaker, on behalf of the Prime Minister, yes, although I should have been more precise in my response to the supplementary question and said making a statement to the police rather than reporting a matter. Mr Robertson sought to clarify that answer. Isn't it in fact correct that he did not report the matter to the police about Todd Barclay recording his staff, but rather that they asked to interview him because they had found out about his texts confirming this during their investigation? The Honourable Jerry Brownley on behalf of the Prime Speaker, Minister. On behalf of the Prime Minister, I hear the calls from across the House that this is a cover-up. Let me be very clear. The only cover-up in this country today is the immigration scam by the Labour Party for their campaign purposes. The New Zealand First Leader Winston Peters says Mr English should resign for making what he claims are misleading statements to Parliament about Todd Barclay. Mr Peters says he's laid formal complaints with the Speaker of the House about Mr English's statements. The Prime Minister in the House yesterday made a statement that was demonstrably not true. He said he had no knowledge of the settlement and the hush fund. And then you look at the um, text he's been sending to the electric chairperson and it's clear as daylight that he knew all about it. There have also been claims a National Party board member contacted Ms Dixon about withdrawing her police complaint. In a statement, the party's secretary, Greg Hamilton, says board members, including Glenda Hughes, had various discussions with numerous National Party members, including the Southland, over several months. But he says those conversations and all discussions around the board table are private and it would be inappropriate to discuss them in the media. Meanwhile, the police say they'll decide next week whether or not they'll reopen the investigation into Todd Barclay. From Parliament for Checkpoint, Jane Patterson. 12 minutes past six, the marae at the centre of Labour's intern controversy is rejecting claims their accommodation is substandard. Up to 90 interns have complained they were put in a cramped dormitory, alcoves with doors hanging off their hinges and unusable showers. The marae CEO admits his accommodation isn't five star, but Anthony Wilson says if the interns aren't happy, he wishes them all the best if they want to move on. In a moment, we'll speak to Labour leader Andrew Little about what's been going on. But first, our Māori Issues correspondent, Mihi Narangi Forbes, reports on a tug of war between the Awataha Marae and its people. The 90 interns were invited to Aotearoa to work on voter enrolment and were based on the North Shore Marae Awataha, where they were staying for free. The news website Politic has photos of cramped dormitories, broken and unusable showers, doors hanging off hinges and unfinished construction work with material piled beside mattresses. In a phone conversation today, the marae head Anthony Wilson rejected the complaints but ended the call when he was asked how much the marae had been paid. Labour Party's secretary Andrew Curtin also won't say how much or who was paying to put up the interns, but he is planning to move all of them to different accommodation. Hohepa McLean is leading the charge against the Awataha Marae management and says he's disheartened the Labour Party was allowed access. He wants to know how much money has been made from the visitors. And our question, I suppose, would be, uh, where has all that money been going back to? Because it hasn't been, obviously hasn't been going back into the facility. So we can see that they've opened the doors to 80 international students. Uh, yet there was 80 local members of the community that were wanting uh, access to the marae to be able to use it uh, for their own needs too. Generations of urban Māori have been fighting for access to the marae, which they claim puts tourism before tikanga. But Mr McLean says this is a case of foreigners before Māori. He says 83 members of their group had attempted to join the incorporated society that ran the marae, but they were all declined. News, the Labour Party has an arrangement, was disheartening. It is a slap in the face. These people aren't from the community. 
they've got nothing to do with the community. And the reason they're here has got nothing to do with the community. So actually, it's, it's a contradiction. It shows the hypocrisy of how that marae has been run. Um, so again, the benefit goes back to them, uh, whilst uh, the community is left with nothing. Anthony Wilson disagrees there's any conflict between the marae management and the local community. I don't think that's actually true. But, um, you know, like first instance, um, I think you need to talk to, because I think it's a little bit unclear mm. as to what, what the issues are with, with this whole pake. But Mr McLean says the community is unable to use the marae for hui, celebrations and tangi. Mr McLean says when one of their loved ones passes away, the community marae is never available to them. They're held at the, at the person's home. You know, there's been the phrase of the garage tangi. Uh, they're either sitting in the lounge and so the rest of the house has to be closed off, allowing space in the lounge for the visitors. The garage and surrounding area has to be used as an old school kitchen, cooking on burners and things like that. So most of the time they're in little standard three bedroom houses. Anthony Wilson says the marae is used by tens of thousands of visitors every year, including many from overseas. Mo te hōtaka o te ahiahinei ko Mihingarangi Forbes. Aho. So up to 90 interns, cramped conditions in a marae, a promised lecture by Helen Clark and much more. None of it has eventuated or very little. And because they're volunteers, no money to change their flights to return home. I asked the Labour leader, Andrew Little, a short time ago if he thought this was a good look. Well, it's certainly embarrassing, if I'm totally honest. Uh, I think this is a, a project that started with good intentions. I think the expectation was that it would be a reasonably modest number of people would come here. Um, and then I was certainly advised at the beginning of the week that the you know, the people looking after uh, the young interns coming here had frankly overreached themselves. It had got to a pretty bad situation. And I, you know, having talked to the party about it, I just said, you're going to have to step in, take control, because the primary thing we have to look out for is the well-being and welfare of those young people. How many young people are there now? How many in total? I understand it's about 90. Um, I don't have the specific figures, but it's a sizable number. It's way beyond uh, certainly what I had understood a few months ago when people were talking about it, um, the number would be. OK, so so you knew a few months ago, did you, that this was happening? Oh, we were, the people who raised it with me and said, listen, wouldn't be a good idea. Uh, look, we've had international interns come and work on campaigns before, and it's a pretty common thing for uh, young people and, and political parties here to go to the US, to Australia, to the UK to help in political And campaigns. is that where they're from? Where have these youngsters come from? Yeah, from the US, from the uh, Australia and the UK, as I understand it. And why did they come? What did they think they were going to get when they arrived here? Well, as it was explained to me when this thing was being put together, it was it was as young New Zealanders going over to those countries do. It was to get involved in uh, political campaigning here, and as you know, general election here. So we've done it. We've had very small numbers of people come here before from other countries. We've sent people to other countries. Um, it was to be that that flavour of thing. Okay. Have they been exploited? Have they been treated in an entirely cavalier and disrespectful fashion? Well, they clearly haven't been treated satisfactorily. As I understand it, the, you know, the accommodation arrangements certainly haven't been acceptable. Um, that's why I've said, listen, we've, we've, you've got to, you know, it's their well-being is the critical issue that's got to be sorted out. And that's why it's people from party headquarters has now stepped in and taken control and now sorting out those sorts of things. I mean, OK, okay so of the 90... We, 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 we have international volunteers before, and it's usually done on a billet basis, and they get looked after, and they help out in, in campaigning on political issues. OK, so of the 90, how many are going to stay on under these circumstances? I, I'm not um, aware that I'm not that close to it. I know, as I say, party officials, including the General Secretary, Andrew Curtin, are dealing with all those sorts of things now. I haven't had a briefing from him. I got a briefing yesterday. I haven't had one since, but he's been working on this since the beginning of the week and getting those issues sorted out. OK. Stephen Joyce has accused Labour of industrial strength hypocrisy, and I'm looking at an op-ed that you wrote for the New Zealand Herald on the 8th of May, so last month. And you say people are rightly asking why the government hasn't prepared for the record number of new immigrants. Then you go on to say you wouldn't invite a whole lot of people over for the weekend and have nowhere for them to sleep. But that's effectively what National is doing. It's also a effectively what Matt McCartan and Labor have done. And it really is 
uh, disastrously poor planning. And in the context of Labour's immigration policy, a sh you've shot yourself in the foot, haven't you? No, it's a, um, it, there's no link between having an international internship programme for political campaigning and, and immigration policy, which you know, a government has used to um, be part of its economic growth programme. So, wait, wait a course, it's, course, the, it's the universal, and, it's the universal in the particular, isn't it? And, and, it is, and it is precisely the point the government's making. Actually, immigration provides us with people who present enthusiasm, energy and skills that we need in New Zealand. Now, clearly Matt McCartan felt the same way. Over and above that, you are criticising the government for their inability to handle the immigrants when they arrive. Lo and behold, Matt McCartan and the Labour Party have done the same thing. Don't you see that? What I see is, what I said right at the beginning of the interview, is that what started out as a well-intended, pretty modest idea about you know, doing something we've done in the past, bringing international interns over to help with political campaigning, has kind of got ahead of itself. People have got very enthusiastic. The numbers coming here are way beyond the ability of those people to manage it. Now the party has, party headquarters have had to step in and take control of it and, and sort mm -hmm. those things out. Trying to draw some, you know... Um, comparison with running an immigration policy? Sorry, far-fetched. It's not far-fetched, is it? Because isn't this why we have immigrants? Because they bring skills and experiences and energy that sometimes you can't provide from home. Why did Matt McCartan need these 90 people? Why did you need them? Why couldn't there are a whole lot of young people in New Zealand who could have done this? And the answer you will give is precisely the same answer that the national government is giving, and that is they bring something that you felt and Matt McCartan felt couldn't be provided here. The way um, international political campaigning internships work is that young people want to get limited experience in campaigns overseas. So there'll be people from the Young Nationals and people from Young Labour who will go and work for the Republicans and the Democrats respectively, usually, might go and work for the Liberals in Australia and the ALP there, and they'll work for anywhere between you know two or three weeks to a couple of months on a political campaign to see what those political systems look like, and then they go home. That, that's not an immigration policy. That's a political internship program with a, a little bit of international exchange. That, that, that's, that's not an immigration policy. Sorry, I don't accept your comparison. Labour leader Andrew Little talking to us a short time ago. Akshay Chan's lawyer says she sought bail on his behalf, believing his mother and aunt would monitor his every movement. But the condition was never included in his bail bond and there was a two and a half hour window when Chan was left home alone. A month after being granted bail for kidnapping Christy Marceau at Knife Point, Shan took the two-minute walk to the Marceau family home and stabbed the 18-year-old to death. Our Auckland Court reporter Edward Gay has been covering the inquest into Miss Marceau's death and he filed this report. Mary Ann Lowe was Chan's lawyer. She told the coroner's inquest today that she met with Chan's mother and aunt before and after each of the four hearings at the North Shore District Court. She said she sought assurances from them that they could monitor Chand if he was given bail on a 24-hour curfew. I would have asked them, is that a realistic scenario? Because I don't propose bail conditions unless I'm assured that they can be met. So I would have been very clear that if that was going to be the proposal, one of them had to be at the property throughout that time. She said she believed the pair understood their obligations when Chand was eventually granted bail in October 2011. But under cross-examination from the Chand family lawyer, Alex witten Hanna, Miss Lowe confirmed there was no mention of a monitoring condition on the bail bond. Did you explain to them anything to the effect that they might have to, one of them, stay awake all night, for example, so that Akshay wouldn't sneak out of the house? No, I didn't discuss that. Because unless someone was awake at 2 o'clock in the morning, watching him, there'd be nothing to prevent him leaving, would there? No. And in fact, on the morning of the 7th of November, he snuck out of the house at 7am when his sister was asleep. I understand so, yes. Slow also confirmed she didn't write to the pair advising them of their responsibilities. The Marceau's family lawyer, Nicky Pender, asked if the offer of monitoring made bail more palatable to the judge. This was a young person, he was only 18, he hadn't been in trouble with the police before and he was obviously suffering from a mental illness and all of those circumstances 
uh, it seemed appropriate. But there was also a two and a half hour gap in the monitoring between Mrs Chand leaving for work in the early morning and his aunt getting her son off to school. I was not aware of that gap. So if you had been aware of that, you would not have been in a position to submit to the court uh, as you did that uh, Mr Chan would, would never be alone. Correct. She was also questioned about a letter written to the court by Christy Marceau opposing Chan's bail because she had concerns for her own safety. I didn't even show it to him or his family because in my um, view it contained information about Ms Marceau's comings and goings that I didn't want to be responsible for having um, Mr Chand or his family aware of. So I distinctly and deliberately did not show them or give them copies of that document. At the final bail hearing, no mention was made that Chand's mother's home was just a kilometre from the Marceau's. Miss Lowe was asked by Hannah Janes, the lawyer assisting the coroner, if there was an ethical obligation stopping her for continuing to apply for bail at an address that an earlier judge raised concerns about. My obligation was to apply for bail to the family home and to follow my instructions with my client. The police were aware of the issues with the, with the bail. Um, address. She said a police prosecutor was in court at the time and had the opportunity to raise their concerns. She said she assumed the notes of the judge had been transcribed and were on the court record. Coroner Catherine Gregg ended today by thanking the Marceaus for their attendance. She said she would deliver her decision as soon as she could. Tracy Marceau, Christie's mother, told the coroner they had waited six years and they're not going away. The inquest is still to hear from Dr Jeremy Skipworth, the clinical director of the Mason Clinic, but that won't happen until July 7. Mō te hō taka o te ahi ahi ko Edward Gaya Ho. It's 26 minutes past six on a Thursday night and we're going to turn now to something tremendously important or not but kind of interesting. Queen Elizabeth has opened the UK Parliament wearing a hat with a striking resemblance to the EU's flag. Big discussion about this in our office today. Delivering a formal speech in which Prime Minister Theresa May government laid out the strategy for exiting the EU, the Queen sported a blue chapeau decorated with an arc of blue flowers, each with a bright yellow disc at its centre. It looks like the European flag, thundered the UK's Daily Mail newspaper which thunders about a lot of things. The BBC's Julie McFarlane reports. For the first time in 43 years, Elizabeth II did not wear her crown to the Queen's speech, but it's her hat that's got everyone talking. My Lords and members of the House of Commons, Look familiar? As Her Majesty outlined the 27 bills that will form the government's two-year agenda, users took to Twitter to note the striking resemblance with her royal blue hat, its seven yellow flowers and the stars of the European flag. One confused Twitter user wrote, Is the Queen sending a message by wearing a European hat, blue with gold stars? Loving the Queen's EU bonnet, said a certain former Great British Bake Off presenter. And from a European journalist in Brussels, message received. The Queen, as head of state, is politically neutral, and on political matters she acts upon the advice of her government. But that won't stop many people from speculating theories as to whether Her Majesty was sending a coded message, or even having a bit of fun. Uh, just before we go tonight, lots of feedback um, on, of course, Todd Barclay and Bill English and the interns in Labour. Let's start with the latter. Bad look for Labour that those interns haven't been looked after. But contrast Andrew Little's honesty with Bill English's duplicity over the behaviour of his protégé and his own behaviour, says Liz. Labour's embarrassment, 30 of the students have asked the marae if they can stay on. They love it. We've received a few texts and comments saying that. We've tried tremendously hard to talk to some of the students. The marae... Uh, not letting us do so. We're very, very keen. If there are students are here and they're having a wonderful time, uh, we would love to talk to them. If the Marae could facilitate that kind of access, we would be very grateful because we keep being told about it, but we're not hearing it directly. After the teapot tape affair, English should have a steer on, illeg on the illegality of secret recordings. And it's a bit rich to say police investigation found nothing when Barclay refused to cooperate, says Katie. Bill English and National should admit they did the wrong thing in not showing Barclay the door last year. Take responsibility for handling it badly instead of making excuses about it. Could you please ask how much taxpayers' money was paid from the Prime Minister's fund as compensation as hush money to the person illegally recorded? Yes, we have repeatedly, and we're not getting an answer. 
And John, I know a fair bit about employment law and can tell you that those Labour interns are as completely in breach of our Labour laws as the people traffickers recently prosecuted. They're not volunteers. They are undocumented employees. If I did the same thing for my company, you'd tear me to pieces. The fact that it's the Labour Party is unbelievable and an embarrassment, says Scott and Nelson. We really like hearing from you. Text us on 2101, email checkpoint at radionz.co.nz. Thank you for listening and thank you for joining in with feedback like that. That brings us for, uh, to an end for the programme tonight. It's 29 and a half past six. Katrina will be along with the headlines shortly, but let's go out tonight on our magnificent sting, courtesy of Lawrence Arabia, a.k.a. James Milne. RNZ News Headlines at 6.30. The fallout over National MP Todd Barclay has today had the Prime Minister rejecting allegations of a cover-up. Meanwhile, the police are now looking again at the affair and will decide whether to reopen the investigation soon. The Labour Party is being accused of hypocritical behaviour after dozens of foreign interns complained they were housed in substandard living conditions. Federated Farmers has elected West Coast dairy farmer Katie Milne as the first woman president in its 118-year history. And a council head in London has resigned following severe criticism over the response to last week's huge fire that killed at least 79 people at a social housing tower block. Our next news on weather is at 7. This Saturday morning, can big data predict which children are most at risk of abuse? And what do we do with that information? Professor Rima Vaitia Nathan on 